In Samarkand, I saw a monkey, yellow, splotched, and dying in a cage. And as I made to hasten by, he grasped my sleeve, as if there might be something more to the matter. <clears throat> did you say something, mister? What? Uh, did you say something, mister? No. Oh, I thought you said something. <laughs> I thought you were saying you wanted to read the writing now, mister. Uh, I said nothing, madam. I'm hanging the crate now. Ah. Because if you want, I can let you read the writing now, mister. Uh, madam, I cannot read your master's manuscript now. I am hanging the crate now. You see, you've come at a very bad time. There's been a death in the firm. Our employer, Mr. Gruboff, has passed away. Oh, has he? Yes. That's a sorrow. Yes. And a sorrow it was when my master died. Him being so sadly reduced in fortune. Oh, there was always the money lenders banging at the doors of the house, but I didn't let none of them get at the master. I locked the door in their faces, I did, and I told them what they could do with their accounts receivable. As God is my judge, they would have pulled the sheets right off to the bed he was dying on if I'd have let them so vicious they was about their monies. Oh, dear. What makes people get that way over money, do you suppose, mister? Well, what do you think, Mr. Zodich? Have they buried him yet? The master's house was called the Chulkaturin family house. A Chulkaturin, mister. It's a name but nobody gets right. And him, poor soul, being the last of them what bore the name, who's to care now what the rights and wrongs of saying it be? Well, Mr. Gruboff is tucked away. I'd imagine we could expect some changes, don't you, Mr. Zodich? I think Mr. Pendolevsky would be the man to watch. Huh? So, that's how it is with me, mister. Now, all Mr. Chulkatorin left me for all those cruel months of services to him is what I got here. And it's for making it into a book with you bookmongers, which the gentleman himself was most insistent on, so I could be repaid for my kindnesses to him. <laughs> He didn't give me a bit of wage, just so it's a fair thing I'm doing, trying to make a little money off his writings. Don't you think so, mister? Yes, yes. Oh, uh, not that I begrudge doing a Christian duty for the sick. I mean, doing a Christian duty is oh, no more than what Christ expects of us. Ah, they're back. Miss Grubar, a note of condolence. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Zodich. Yes, I, uh, I just wanted to say that I thought your father was wonderful, Miss Grubaugh, wonderful. A man to be admired, respected. It, uh, it was an honor to be employed by him these 12 years. We will all miss him. A loss, a, a great loss. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I hope it was not too cold for you, Miss Gruboff. <laughs> I thought of you in the carriage, and I said that they will forget the extra blankets. Uh, 
Excuse me. Excuse me. He was fine in the carriage, Mr. Zodich. Thank you. Uh, bring up the tea to Mrs. Gru Miss Grubo. Mm -hmm. And uh, a cup for me. Yes, Mr. Pendelips. Right away. Oh, where are you going? It's my privilege to bring up the tea. Oh. Now, <laughs> oh, where do you think you're going and what are you doing, Mr. <laughs> Rubin? It is my privilege. <laughs> Mr. Rubin! <laughs> it is my privilege for the tea. We get the tea and you get the tea. We bring that over, Mr. Rubin. Stop it. Mr. Rubin. Mr. Rubin. Yeah. Please bring that out. Mr. Rubin. It is my responsibility to bring up the tea. Mr. Will you, will you let go of it? Mr. Pendelevsky was talking to me. He was not, Mr. Rubin. He was talking to me. Now, look. I've always brought the tea to Mr. Gruboff, and now I will bring the tea to Miss Gruboff. Will you let go? I am to bring the tea. He was talking to me. I'm not going to let go. <laughs> you let go. <laughs> he was talking to me now. Don't be silly, Mr. Rubin. I'm not going to let go. I'm not being silly. Let go now. <laughs> You're being very silly. No, it is you who are being very silly. You. 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 Ah. Ah. The master was a very refined type, such as you, Mr. Zodich. Oh. <laughs> oh, and he had a very sensitive handwriting, which comes from being so acute to everything around him. Oh, and you could tell that he was delicate just by looking at his hand. A madhouse, a madhouse. Up the ladder, is it? Oh, yes, a madhouse it all is for sure. That's what the master said when he was trying to save the family properties which his father had gambled away. Who said, madam? Why do you go on and on? What are you talking about? The master! Oh, he was as much a fighter for things what was his as ever death took away. He wasn't one for giving up on things. Oh, he was a brave sort. No, could, no one could grudge him that. And God love him for it. <laughs> so, you're finished. This is a diary, madam. <laughs> we do not publish diaries. You've talked all this time for nothing. No, 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 mister. This ain't no diary. It's papers. Oh, it's, a, uh, it's a diary, madam. You see, March 20th, a day of the month. That's a diary. Oh, I, I can't read dates, mister. I can't read, mister. Well, I read dates, madam, and I tell you it's a diary, and we do not read diaries. Nor have we ever in the entire history of Grubal Publications published one. So if you'll excuse me. Well, you know, it was only as a favor to the poor gentleman when wrote it because he wanted to repay me for my goodness and kindnesses to him that I come here at all. Oh, he was a good talker and word writer, mister. Oh, he was, was he? Mm. A good writer, was he? Well, he had bad handwriting. How does that suit you? He wrote with a hand up a pygmy. <laughs> tiny, tiny letters, too backward, too feminine. And where's the punctuation? Do you see the punctuation? What has he done with that? <laughs> Perhaps this is a very long sentence and all the punctuation's on the next page. <laughs> oh, here's a comma. <laughs> I, I found a comma, Mr. Rubin. <laughs> but where are, the, where are the periods? Where are the periods? The, the colons, the semicolons, the, uh, the question marks, where? Oh, he's just writing, mister. Perhaps he's put all the punctuation on the last page. No, I do not see them. In the middle, perhaps. They must be stored in the middle. <laughs> No, they are not in the middle. So I will shake the pages. Let's see if they fall out. It's just <laughs> writing, mister. All right. Now, it's not just writing. There is only proper and improper writing. You're Mr. Chokaturin. You see, he doesn't cross his T's. He ignores his T's. He makes his T's look like L's, and his L's like B's, and his B's like H's, and his H's like nothing at all. And why doesn't he dot his I's? Why doesn't he loop his E's? Hmm? I'll tell you why. Because he doesn't know anything, you see. Because he doesn't know how to write. See, we have here a babbling of consonants, a scribbling scribble, a disease that knows no punctuation, no sentencing, no paragraphing, a singular disease that rambles, <laughs> that goes no place, that floats on strings of bombast, 
a leaking hulk of language in a sea of rhetoric, a babbling monument of incoherency, a vacuum, a desert, a wasteland, a void. Read it. Take it home with you, Mr. Zodich, and read it. <laughs> Work your lungs out, you bitches. You think I'm afraid of your dogs, Katarina Polomaya? I'll take a stick to them and I'll beat their brains in. with me. I will not read it. <laughs> Chokaturin, Mr. Uh, Chokaturin. <laughs> you gentlemen, you impossible name. So much the worse for you if you believe worms make uh, distinctions underground. There are no distinctions on the ground, no gentleman's worm, no worm with an uncommon body, an uncommon mouth. You uh, won't find them to your liking, I assure you. <laughs> Rest assured, worms don't get down to boot level. You won't get their tongue on your boot. They don't know about the summer houses you had, your Mediterranean villas, your ladies. Damn your ladies. Damn your fruits and peppermint creams. Their parasols, their lawn parties, your fresh meat and ice creams, your sailboats, <laughs> your insolences. Here you come to me, down to me, and you satisfy me or I'll ship you into oblivion. I'll take your bones and mangle them. I'll break your back. I'll break your head. Why don't you shut your mouth, you sack of hot air? You scum, you dregs, you garbage, you horse's tail. Do not think that injustice goes unpunished. Do not think that this is the office. Here there is freedom. Here you watch what you say to me. Trip to the uh, cemetery does not make a love affair. Keep your hands off my water jug! On the trip to the cemetery, it was uh, boringly obvious which direction the affection of Miss Grubov lay. Spreading a blanket to cover our legs from the chill, I found by some subtle snaky motion of her torso, she connived it so that one, two, three, our hips 
and flanks were dancing side to side to the rolling of the wheels. Uh, hand me the soap. Who do you think you're ordering about? I'm the head of the reader section, the first reader. You carbuncle, you, 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 uh, wart, you, <laughs> you pimple. <laughs> I don't take orders from you. I'll, uh, dance on your grave before I'm through. <laughs> Hardly had this dance begun, when by a writhing of her arms, a heaving breathing of her bosom, as if the desire in her must burst, she seized hold of my fingers one by one and locked them in the compass of her hand. Get me the soap. All right, I'm warning you, Panofsky. Watch what you say to me. Now, just be careful. Do not push me too far. I will not put up with these lies. <sighs> Seizing thus by hand, she covered it with kisses and sent it, as it were, on a foreign exploration to private lands best left undiscovered outside the marriage bed. I pretended fright, surprised, but her importunities and protestations were of such a severe necessity... I at last gave way and exposed her bosom. Get me the soap. You liar. You defamer. What right do you have to say such things? The soap. The soap is it. I'll get you the soap. I'll wash you into the ground. I'll scrub your brains out. We'll see who's who superior. We'll see about trip to the cemetery. You cock! You liar! You buzzard! You ink Down the stairs with you! Monstrous liar! Vilifier! Oh. Right do you have to say such things? What right to say such things? Once having seduced Miss Grubel, once having aroused in her the fevered breath of passion, which I found most sour to the smell, I suppose I have all rights to say what pleases me. Hand me the towel. Ah, uh, it was uh, then that I thrust your name into the conversation, where it fell like a small stone dropped from some low height into the sea. And what of Sodich, I said. And when there was no sign of recognition on the lady's lips, I pressed forward with encouragements to her remembrance. Ah, uh, 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 the rude fellow. The crude fellow. Ah, uh, the open the door and if you please fellow. The tea fellow, the biscuit fellow, the ABC and Lupuries fellow. But there was no remembrance. You are, nevertheless, welcome to the wedding, along with the bookkeeper and the printer's apprentice. Hand me a towel. There will be no wedding. Oh, yes. Yeah. A very large wedding. Hand me the towel. There will be no wedding. She is untouched. <laughs> I have washed my fingers, have I not? Do I wash my fingers for no reason? Hand me the towel. Oh. I'll give you the towel. Sleep with the devil in hell tonight. Enough of your lies, your insults. Enough. It's finished. <laughs> Idiot. Was it too cold, Miss Grubaugh? I thought of you in the carriage, and I said that they will get the extra blankets. And Miss Grubaugh will be cold. 
It is a long drive to any cemetery, and the horses move so slowly. Yes, it was cold. And it's too bad. In the winter, when death comes to Petersburg, he takes the large and the small. I have heard 40 to 50 cats. Their eyes like jelly eyes, their whiskers stiff as banjo wire, die each night. I have heard a like number of cur bitches with teeth so locked with rhyme they could not suck their puppies, die each night. I have heard that birds innumerable die each night seeking the warmth and chimney smoke. And I thought of you, huddled in the carriage, your father before you, his great black coat wrapped about him, and his eyes shut to eternity come. And I said that she will listen to the sound of the horses kicking up the ice, and she will know in her heart she is alone. I sat in the chapel with my father, and the cold sunlight shone over the length of his body, and I was alone. There was loneliness. I was alone. Lonely. What were you thinking of? I, I thought of nothing. I saw nothing. Without being nothing. Nothing. to be promoted. Yes, <laughs> I will promote you. <laughs> I will fire Pendlevsky. I will set my desk in the main office. I will have tea served to me. I will have what is mine to have. I will buy a sailboat. I'll buy a carriage. To go to the opera. You shall have all, all. I love you. <laughs> Marry me. Marry. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Ah. Mr. Zodich, we can't go on with our feet on the same run. There are matters that have come to my attention, Mr. Zodich. What, what matters? Complaints that may lead to your dismissal. This is impossible. If I, your father promised to advance me. I've told everybody I'm to be advanced. My father is dead. Death causes change. Well, but there can be no change in this. I've served with loyalty for 12 years. Those who have watched you say you seek a strange advancement. They are liars, Miss Gruboff. You must not listen to their lies. They are madmen. Do they lie? Yes, Miss Gruboff, they lie. Miss Gruboff, <laughs> Miss Gruboff, you don't know them, how they connive, how they watch me to discover evil, they distort me, they, they twist me in the shapes I am not, Miss Gruboff. It is they who harbor strange advancements. Uh, it is they, Miss Gruboff, I can give you their names. Can you? Yes, it is the man in the, uh, the man in the bookkeeper section and the, uh, the printer's apprentice. You see, I know them. I know them. I spit on them. They do not respect your virginity. <laughs> they make jokes. It is they who seek strange advancement. <laughs> Miss Gruboff. All right. All right, all right Miss Gruboff. <laughs> you know, all right, now. Miss Gruboff, don't treat me this way. I'm not a nothing, you know. I'm a man to be respected. I'm a man of sentiments, Miss Gruboff. <laughs> Stop it! Stop it! You have no right to do this to me! You have no right! What do you think I am? You think I'm a toad? A nothing. A nothing? I'm a man to be respected. Everybody in this house comes to me because I'm a man of influence. <laughs> this is my bed! <laughs> Do you think that there were 
that there, there were not affairs that I had. What do you know of that? When I was not even 20 years old, there was a woman who wanted to marry me. Said I was handsome. She thought I was a soldier. Could have been an officer by now. I had absolutely no one to speak for me. I could have been a captain by now. I, Nikolai Alexeyevich Chulkaturin, in my 29th year, certain in the hope of the resurrection and the life to come, begin this my diary at Lambswater, March the 20th, 1870. I had no one to speak for me. Hmm. The doctor, the same doctor who brought me into this world, came this morning with his black bag of useless medicines to tell me that I must now prepare myself to be shortly ushered out of it. At the end of his medical subterfuges and hem-hawing terminologies, he told me only what I already knew. I am to die. So be it. My life has been as brief as it has been meaningless. And death's a goodness, for all we know. I will leave this for you, Nikolai. If you are troubled by pain, you are to take a teaspoonful. In any event, take a teaspoonful before you retire. It will assure you of a good night's sleep. It's opium. If you should dream, pay no attention to it. This morning, I dreamt I was in a great cage in some marketplace I had never seen before. The sun burned down upon me and I could not escape. I kept sticking my hand through the bars of the cage, grasping at those who passed by, but they would not stop, and I had lost all power to speak. I could not breathe. I felt myself suffocating, and no person stopped. I will have that... Uh... Terran Tevnia of yours, leave the window open a crack before you retire this evening. Oh, there you are. It's about time. Well, come in, come in. There's some sheets in the closet I want you to take down to wash. In here? Yes, of course. Now, be quick about it. Ah! What's the matter? There's blood on them. Well, never mind what's on them. Just take them downstairs. <sighs> Stupid woman. If your father were alive, he'd have taken her by the neck and tossed her out. <laughs> I'll take you by the neck and I'll toss you out. Do you know what she was doing when I came in this morning? Hmm? Sleeping. There she was, stretched out on the bed, big as life, with a bottle of vodka clutched to her chest and her legs dangling to the floor. <laughs> She's allowed the downstairs to become a rat's den. Terentevia is old and she drinks, but she is here when I need her. Her grandson is somewhat backward. Every day, he sticks his head into the room to make sure that I have not made off with the closet. He fancies my clothes. <laughs> and the old woman? What does she fancy? The house. Look here, Nikolai. This is none of my affair, but if you do not watch what you are doing, they will rob the teeth out of your head before they're done. Do not underestimate the cunning of poor people. You do not know them. I have never known anybody, Dr. Corvin. 
But do not worry, nothing is settled yet. We negotiate day by day. Besides, to whom else should these clothes and this house belong? By the time I am gone, she will have earned this roof over her head. And the summer house? What has become of that? Sold at auction. A cloth merchant from Novgorod. A man who had to have a summer house. This is all quite distressing to hear, Nikolai. Surely some other alternative presented itself to you? No, no, no. Let the summer house be gone. What it meant to my father, it never meant to me. And for it, the Chulkaturin's father and son are at last quits with the human race. I have paid off the last of my father's obligations. Do not look so concerned, doctor. Obligations must be met. Surely your friends will not permit this, Nikolai. It's demeaning. You are no merchant, son. I have no friends, doctor. <laughs> but you, you've had friends. At the university, I'm sure you made many friends. Every man has friends. Upon meeting my friends on the streets of the university, why, it's Chulkaturin, they say. And when I approach, the circle of friends parts as if some slightly leprous thing had been thrust into their midst. And the eyes which had been set upon my eyes begin dropping from my face to my chest to my knees to the bottoms of my feet. And everybody stands absolutely struck still, desperately trying to remember what it was they were saying before I arrived. Once I am ten feet past, the circle once again shrinks, the eyes once more rise, and the conversation moves like fish hustling down the dawn. O oh Christ, that the circles of this world might shrink and find me standing locked inside. Try not to have too many visitors, Nikolai. You must get your rest. Doctor, I will see to it that you are paid as soon as I can. March 22nd. Lawyer Levinoff came yesterday, and as I signed the papers giving the house over to Tarantevnia upon my death, I felt that by that simple signature I had somehow set myself irrevocably free. As a piece of ice that has been bound all winter flows at last down to the sea, so I too have become unbound. To flow where? God knows. I find myself hard put to even describe the coach ride over. The driver, a lunatic of a fellow who's absolutely insensitive to anything other than meeting his schedule. Although the four horses we had were good and we were flying along, this madman insisted on adding a fifth horse. This poor horse was completely out of place, completely superfluous. Assigned there to Mr. Chilkaturin. And how was this unnecessary horse fastened to the carriage? Absolutely all wrong. By means of a short thick rope that constantly cut into his flanks so that his flesh was at all times positively lacerated. How we expected the beast to run naturally when its entire body was arched in pain, I don't know. And what was this lunatic's reaction when I informed him we'd do better without this superfluous horse? And there as well, Mr. Chilkaturin. He began lashing the horse an additional dozen strokes across its back and swollen belly and screaming out to the winds, what the hell? It's been tied on, and if not to run, what the hell for? March 23rd, Sunday. The church bells have been ringing all morning. Heavy, slow, melodious. And so they will ring when I am no longer here to listen. I cannot bear to hear them. I've had Terentevnia shut the window tight, but still the sound washes into the empty room, filling every corner. In darkness, I see the meadow where once I played, 
the branches of my plum tree bending with fruit, the small streams where I caught carp, the places where I ran in my youth. Oh, my Christ! If I cannot say goodbye to the summers that warmed me, the winters I put my fur hat onto, if I cannot say goodbye, what shall I do? Who will have pity for us all? Pity? Oh, why do you waste my time with pity? There is no pity. Up the ladder, down the ladder, make up your mind to it. Do not live in a delusion that you'll put tears in my eyes, Chokajuran. In me, you do not deal with an amateur of suffering. The church bells have been ringing all morning. Let them ring. Every bell rings, every dog cries, every sheep bleats tears. The public is not interested in suffering, Chokajuran. In me, you deal with the public. All right. Who is to buy the lungs and brains of you? All right, that is why I have to decide. All right. That is why I am a first reader. That Who is that? Mesa, the house girl, feathers. What do you want? Katharina Prolomnaya sent me with a bucket of coal. <laughs> but, but don't stand there smiling all night. I have important work that must be done. We can't all afford to live like uh, princesses. <laughs> Should, should I put the call in the stove for you, Mr. Zardich? Yes. Yeah. And why have you brought the coal to all the others and only now to me? Why am I the last? I won't forget that, Miss Feathers. No, no, sir. No, you're not the last. No, the others aren't having any coal at all tonight, sir. Only you. <laughs> the mistress said, let them freeze. The city would be better off without them. Do not give me stories, Miss Feathers. Coal does not grow on uh, plum trees. <laughs> You're not dealing with a man who lives in fairy tales. She expects something from this, huh? What does she expect? You see, uh, nobody does anything without expectations. If she expects uh, to be paid now, I cannot tell you now. To be advanced in the publishing business is not to be made a prince. I didn't ask for extra call. The, the mistress said nothing about asking for money. Sir. Nothing? What nothing? Watch what you're doing there. Mr. Fenders, you're putting in too much at once. Oh, you're not dealing with the spendthrift, Miss Feathers. Miss, Mr. Zodich, I was, I was supposed to bring you this kerosene also. Why? She expects to make up on the coal by overcharging me on the oil. That's it, isn't it? Huh? Oh, I will not pay a kopeck for the coal. I will not pay for the, for the oil. I ask for nothing, and from nothing comes nothing. I cannot afford the, these extravagances. The, mi the mistress said nothing about asking for money for the kerosene, sir. You tell, Kat <laughs> you tell Katarina Polomnaya that I cannot afford extravagances. Yeah. I live close to the bone. I'm trying to stop <laughs> smiling. Yeah. Yeah. Is she so rich that she can afford to give something for nothing? From what rich? Husband die knowing the moneylenders. <laughs> Everybody knows he died owing the moneylenders. <laughs> but if he didn't die owing the moneylenders, if. So, Nikolai, so. What has happened is a certain flow of blood from the lungs, you understand? Now we must engage in the removal of a light quantity of blood. You will feel better after you are bled. Of course, it is to be expected that the spittle from the lungs will be somewhat pasty, like clay, even like clay. A slight disruption of the digestive organs, an increased frequency of intestinal discharge, in turn produces an additional grabbing and uncontracting, as it were, of the bowels, which in turn leads to the diarrhea. So you must not distress yourself about keeping the sheets clean. That is nothing to distress yourself about. A trifle of blood, a trifle of excrement, you understand. So? So? Well, who's to say what handsome is? Katrina Polomnaya's first husband was short. 
What was Napoleon if not short? Or Caesar? Venevitivicki. Is the medical fact that the short man, by having his heart placed closer to his brain, enjoys a richer supply of blood? Ergo, a proportionate enlargement of the cranial area, so that he becomes quicker in wit, more active in deed, and greater in accomplishment. <laughs> to marry Katerina Polomaya would be a diminishment. Think, dear Christ, have you made me anything more than Lawyer Levinoff's fifth horse? If I had never lived, it would have made no difference to anyone. My entire existence has been superfluous. That is the central fact of my being, the central word that sums up my total meaning. Think, dear Christ, is that not so? Have you not made me a fifth horse fastened uselessly to the coach of life? To whose benefit do I run? For whose benefit am I beaten? <laughs> oh, my Christ. Where is my post house? <laughs> <laughs> so it is a husband she is after. <laughs> She sends Miss Chimney Sweep with the kerosene to keep me from getting an eye strain. Well, five feet, four inches can hardly be considered short in any event. She doesn't wish me to be eye strained because she's concerned. Uh -huh. See, the call alone might be construed as meaning no more than a mere landlord-tenant relationship. So she just sent the call. She could expect no more than a thank you. But more than a thank you was floating around here. The time I left my gloves on the hall table and she... she she called out to me on the street, uh, Mr. Zonich, your gloves, and the payment of the rent. Did she not say, ah, Mr. Zonich, the rent? What was that, ah, about, ah, Mr. Zonich? See, ahs and ohs have meanings. They just don't, uh, float around the air. One does not just say, ah, uh, oh, just for the pleasure of opening a mouth. <laughs> Surely she loved me even while her husband was alive. <laughs> Hey. April the 2nd, Wednesday. It rains now. A cold, soundless rain that falls into the snow and vanishes. I struggle to separate the days, one from the other. It is useless. I think of you, Lisa. My rainbow, my bird. Caught now, forever fixed in the timeless grace of your 17 years. And I know, as truly as I must have known all these years, that in you and in you alone exists all I shall ever know of useless happiness and useless agony. Now, now I begin. Now, at the end of my life, dear God, I prove that had I never lived, it would have made no difference to anyone. Some years ago, I was obliged to spend some months in a small town in one of the more remote districts, a town overrun by mud and goats. Fortunately, the parents of an acquaintance I had known for a single term at the university lived there. And before I found myself desperate with boredom, I resolved to pay a call. I sent a boy from the inn I was lodged at to announce my arrival to the Azhogins. If he's going to call, why doesn't he call? And why isn't the dinner ready yet? It's already after 12. How much longer must we wait to eat? Well, I don't know, dear. Lisa, go into the kitchen and find out what they're doing there. Elisabetta. Yes, Papa? Go into the kitchen and find out what the delay is. 
that girl is turning deaf. <laughs> Positively. And crazy as well. All day long with that cage for that bird. <laughs> It's the same with all young girls. There's nothing to be concerned about. Hmm. We will see if you sing the same tune, my friend, when you marry and have a daughter who arranges flowers all day and tickles bullfinches. <laughs> Maybe you should marry my Lisa. Then we will see what you say. <coughs> <coughs> Is he coming to lunch or what? When you send a messenger at lunchtime, you're coming for lunch. What kind of ceremony do we have to go through before he comes? I'll have them set another place. <sighs> Bismyonkov, hmm. uh, there's something I want to talk to you about. Yes. 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 <sighs> yes. It's uh, about Lisa. When you're a father, you notice things. Yes. Well, don't rush me. Who is rushing you? As I was saying, uh, you, you notice things when you're a father. What things? What do you mean, what things? Things. Things. Uh, what I want to know is, uh, what kind of bird is that? A bullfinch. What else could it be? You thought it was an owl? I know it's a bullfinch, but what kind of a bullfinch? A, a Russian bullfinch? A female? Is it a female? You have to look under the feathers for that. Well, well. What difference does it make what sex it is? Isn't it singing all right? Will you look under the feathers and stop asking a thousand questions? It won't raise its tail. Ah, wait a minute. <coughs> What do you want with that little bird? <laughs> no, nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> We're going into the garden. Come. Come, 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 my friend. Excuse me. I, uh, I am Nikolai Alexeyevich Chulkaturin. I am Elizaveta Kirillovna, your sister. <laughs> is, is something wrong? I, I sent a messenger to say that I was to follow. No, there is nothing wrong. Ilya used to talk so much about his university friends. We are expecting another of Ilya's friends to call later this summer. You must know him, Captain Ivan Petrovich Narinsky. I, uh, I don't think so. Ilya used to talk about him all the time. He is the terribly handsome one that I was absolutely forbidden to meet. The one who went into the army. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't recall. Shall I try to place you? I know all of Ilya's friends. Well, I, I, I don't think that outside of our being roommates, we were very oh, close friends. You were the roommate who never attended a single lecture for two years. The boy who never came in from a party earlier than four in the morning. <laughs> no, I think that was the roommate your brother had during his senior year. We were roommates during the second year, the first half of the second year, and then Ilya moved out. Oh, then you must be the one Ilya had that terrible fight with over some dreadful woman. He wrote Papa all about it in a letter. No, no, Ilya and I never had a quarrel. Uh, that was uh, Peter Richter from Prussia. If you give me time, I'll remember just exactly your place in my brother's life. Because Ilya wrote me without fail a letter from Petersburg every week, and I'm sure I know everything he did. You were the one who gambled at the races. I uh, never went to the races. <laughs> that was Ivan Varantsov. You did not own a white stallion? No. You know what I think? It will come to me suddenly. Yes. <laughs> oh. Well, what is the matter? I hope you have not come all this way to see Ilya because he is not here. He left to go abroad for the Tsar. He's in the diplomatic service now, you know, since April. But I'm sure he wrote you about that. <laughs> no. 
He must have forgotten. You must excuse him, it was a very busy time for him. He left for Austria a month after his wedding to Frida Semyonova, who is a blood relative of Prince Adrian. Oh. I'm sorry you weren't able to attend the wedding. So many of Ilya's friends and yours from the university came, but you must have been busy. Yes. Isn't it, darling? Ilya gave it to me when he left. I've been teaching it to sing. Sing a song for the gentleman, Popka. He really sings his heart out when he wants to. <laughs> Come. He's not afraid of you. That's a good sign. It is a well-known fact that birds and animals can instinctively look into the hearts of people and know if they are good or bad. Did you know that? No. <laughs> they can. If you trust the judgment of your pets, they will tell you exactly who your real friends are. <laughs> he is not afraid of you at all. And we shall become friends. Brave little bird. That's a brave little bird. <laughs> I would find it impossible to love someone that an animal feared, wouldn't you? I, I don't know. Will you whistle something for Popka, see if he will sing for oh, you? Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Please? What? <laughs> must prove he is a fool. <laughs> Already the ass. <laughs> is it possible that one day you could open the door to some stranger's house and fall in love? Yes, it is possible. That was the exact moment that I fell in love. I say that without reservation. The moment the door swung open into that household was the exact moment I came to love. And to shut out all the impossible loneliness and misfortune of all the years before, my father's failures, my mother's long-suffering virtues, my less-than-human isolation from mankind. I had now for the first time placed myself in contact with one whose steps would not flee from me, one whose eyes would behold my face and not turn away. It didn't matter that now I stood in front of a bird's cage and forced myself to whistle. <laughs> not even forced myself, I whistled joyfully. You ass. The tune, whose melody I can no longer remember, rose from my heart. A nameless tune from the so long shut closet of my heart broke forth and I brushed against the sleeve of her dress, and she did not move. And the bird broke forth answering me, and I thought as I stood there, God, oh God, don't let me be shut up anymore. What are you talking about? What do you think you're talking about? Who is that? It's me, Gregory from upstairs. What the devil are you doing marching up and back? Have you lost your wits? I must talk to you. About what? Let me come in. I don't want to stand in the hallway. What do you want? Something must be done to increase the amount of coal provided to tenants. We will all freeze to death unless steps are taken with Katerina Prolomnaya. The woman is mad to think that a family could survive a winter's night on half a bucket full of bad coal. Do you know dogs are freezing to death out in the street? Have you heard even as much as one of them howl tonight? By morning there won't be a live dog left in Petersburg. 
Already the water basin in my kitchen has pieces of ice in it the size of your fist. Gregory, why do you bother me with your family problems? Go see Katerina Polomnaya, and I have no time to get involved in this. What are you doing to me? We're neighbors. We live side by side. Side by side? What is that, side by side? When my mother died, who came to me with fruit? When I lay in my bed sick with the fever for three days, who knocked on my door? Who said to me, Zodich, are you there? Zodich, we have come. Zodich, here is a cool towel for your head, huh? Here is some hot soup to warm you. Zodich, we have come. Nobody, eh? Nobody came. But nobody knew. Nobody was informed. Nobody cared. Nobody, Gregory. Katharina Prolomaya, I have come. We won't survive the night. Oh, already the frost is through the window. Surely there is enough compassion in you to... <laughs> Sweet summer, sweet lost summer of days that are no more. Summer of bright birds, summer of flowers, summer of strawberries and golden mornings, summer of musical harmonies in the sky, summer when my heart stood in tune with every living thing, summer when I was not myself, summer when I was in love. Freeze, Gregory. I am not to freeze. Should be a fool not to take my attainments into consideration. Is it nothing to be a first reader in a famous publishing house? It nothing to have read Seneca, Cicero, oh, temporal mores, Senatus Hike Intelligate, Consul Vedit, Hick Tom and Vivit, <laughs> Vivit.
Is it any wonder that Katerina Polomaya should reach for me? Is it every widow who can... who can snatch twice at the gold ring? Katerina Polomaya, do not underestimate my value. I'm no ring for your finger without consideration. Bear in mind, assets. Assets. <laughs> assets. Marriage is a diminishment to me without your assets. <laughs> I don't mind the diminishment as long as there are assets. Go to the Petersburg Ballet. Uh, <laughs> this is not the ballet. <laughs> Don't dance on my time. I could not breathe. There were wildflowers in her hand, her cheek pressed against the floor of the forest as if feeling the unheard music of grass and earth. I clung to the edge of the clearing, afraid to approach, afraid to be seen, afraid of a moment into which I had transgressed. Though love had brought me, I came only as a stranger. Uh, well, you see? <laughs> You've fallen. That's what you get for running so fast. Come, let me help you up. I'm all right. Please, just a moment. I suppose they'll be wondering what happened to us. I cannot imagine how we came to be separated from your parents. <laughs> well, we've certainly taken our exercise for the day. If the summer continues at such a pace, we shall all be in fine health. I haven't run this far since my father raced me in the meadows of lamb's water. <laughs> you, you grow older, you run less. <laughs> you think it was childish of me to run? Oh, no, 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 I didn't mean to imply that. Well, it was. Perhaps it'll be a long time before I run again. Come, sit down beside me. We, we ought to sit on the bench, your dress is going to be covered with grass stains. <laughs> if you make me sit on the bench, I shall fold my hands in my lap and not allow you to become what you should become. And what is that? What do you think that is? I don't know. Yes. I can't. Then you shan't become it. Oh, no, please, tell me. What would you like to become? I don't know. Poor Nikolai Alexeyevich Chukaturin doesn't know what he would like to become. Shall I be kind and tell him then? The king of the May. <laughs> the king of all the hearts of young ladies. Here and now I shall give you a new identity, but you must kneel properly and lower your head. Come. On your knees. <laughs> or else I shall be forced to find another to be king of the May and you shall have lost your identity for good. Don't dally, shall you be crowned no. enough? <laughs> what fine silky hair you have, Nikolai Alexeyevich. Have there been many girls who have loved you for your fine black hair? There has been no one. Perhaps you've forgotten them. The woods are full of the size of young girls. I think there must be many girls you have loved and forgotten. Oh, no, do, do not think that there have been others. Do not... You must hold still. If you raise your head, the flowers will fall. There has been no one who has loved me. Do not think that of me. I think men must be very cruel creatures to play with the hearts of young girls and then not even remember their names. <laughs> men are like that, according to my brother. Why do you laugh? Ilya says that the hearts of young girls are strewn about the world like grains of sand upon the shore, and that there are not so many stars in the night sky as unremembered girls. Do you think that is true? I think that is poetic. 
And is that the same as true? What is your answer to that, Nikolai Alexeyevich, who has fine silky hair? You are making fun of me. Yes. Have I offended you? No. Then what is the matter? Why are you staring into the sun? Must I have reasons for everything? Is it not enough reason to stare at the sun because it is out there? Because it is flaming across the sky? Because it will fall below the horizon and drown in the sea? Because we may never see the light again? Because, 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 because. Have I found enough becauses to satisfy you? Poor Nikolai. It is I who have offended you. Am I completely intolerable to oh, be? Oh, no, you, you cannot See offend how me. soon how every can... flower must fall? Every flower. No, no, no. Don't be angry with me ever, Nikolai. Here. Papa thinks young girls should be placed in hibernation along with Siberian masterlings until we become 18 years old. Then we are to be melted from the ice and returned to our homes in time for marriage. Isn't that terribly clever of Papa? Lisa? Why, why are you crying? Isn't that terribly clever? I suppose I should take my dear book and... Lisa? Lisa, don't cry. Lisa... Are the tears of women ever insignificant? And the tears of young girls, the young girls of our youth who so haunt us in after years, are they so much salt water lost from us forever? Did she not then, standing there in the final light of the sun, love me? Think. Think, if I could not claim every tear, might not there have been a single tear that was for me, a fragment of a tear, a thousandth part of all that running flood loosed for me, for me alone? Could those tears have fallen without me? <laughs> they fall, they fall. Having no mind of their own, women have tears. It's not necessary to philosophize these things. I danced that night. I opened every window to the summer air, struck every candle, from every corner of the room, dispelled every shadow. I took the wine from the landlord's table and brought it to my room. I took the books from the shelves and threw them in the closet. I locked the closet. The tears of a young girl... No. No. The tears of a young woman are bashful, trembling tears. Shall I quote to you the important works of important philosophers that will tell you that, precisely just that, there is no other way for girls to come to love but through tears. Shall I tell you about my future plans? In my happiness, my love, I made future plans. The world was to become involved with me. And I, through Lisa, like some rose flung to the shores of the universe was to become involved with the world. There was the plan involving a wedding that the little provincial town would never forget. The entire town was to be invited down to the last shoemaker. <laughs> you cannot make a wedding out of tears. There's nothing written down here to make weddings from. What are you making weddings from? Why should not the lowest Shoemaker, share my happiness. I wanted everybody I ever brushed against to be happy. Let all those whose hearts were sick be healed. Let all those who were pained in silence be pained no more. I had a family. Ojogin. How rich that simple name sounded. Ojogin. <laughs> Has there ever been a more lovely name, a more beautiful sound upon the air? And Lisa, my Lisa, before me in her wedding dress, her long unbound hair fallen to her shoulders, her eyes lit with happiness. The happiness that would be mine forever. Ah. Oh. 
No more of this. In brass, in leather, in saddle soap, the captain of cavalry called. At present, my stay in the district is quite indefinite. A month, perhaps two. It's difficult to say at the outset. And have you found a suitable place to stay, Ivan Petrovich? Oh, yes, thank you. I've taken rooms at the inn for my officers and myself. Oh, I'm afraid you'll find the inn somewhat less than what you are accustomed to. I'm sure that will be the case. There are no decent accommodations in this entire town. But then hardly anyone ever comes here. <laughs> so there's never any pressing need to have decent accommodations. <laughs> <laughs> I am a soldier, Mr. Bismionkov, and for a soldier, luxury is an unnecessary vice. Yes, of course. A soldier must take the terrain as he finds it. If he finds his feet are wet, well, he must accept his wet feet. <laughs> In my life, such things are of no significance. And what is of significance, Ivan Petrovich? Why, to serve the Tsar, to fight for Russia with courage and with faith. <coughs> yes, that is right. Good day. Good day. Oh, you have a guest. I, I hope I'm not intruding. I, I was just passing by. And, uh, I, uh, I thought that since I was in the vicinity, I would come over. I hope I'm not interrupting. Uh, not a bit. Are you sure? Yes, Because yes, if you wish, I could right. return later. I do not wish to interrupt. You are not interrupting. Now, may I present Captain Ivan Petrovich Narinsky of the Tsar's Cavalry. Captain, this is uh, Nikolai Alexeyevich uh, Chul... Chulkaturin. Chulkaturin, a friend of Ilya's from the university. Ah, a pleasure, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure for me as well. Well, please, go, go on with whatever you were discussing. I, I will just sit here. Oh, no, please. No, no, please. It's perfectly all right. I'm perfectly all right here. What? Is, is that our last chair? I have a thousand chairs in this house. Oh, no, there's no need to bother, Mr. Ajogan. I'm, I'm perfectly all there right. There is a need. No one sits on little stools in my living room. <laughs> So, uh, you knew Ilya from the university, Mr. Cholkaturin? Yes. From the university. Ah. Hmm. <clears throat> Is that where you knew Ilya from? Yes. Ah. Uh, perhaps we've met before, then? I don't think so. Were you one of the young men Ilya brought to my father's summer home? No. It was a hunting trip. I don't hunt. Oh. The captain is here to recruit soldiers for the Tsar's cavalry. So? Yes. Almost noon. Uh, oh, uh, allow me to help you, Mr. Rejogan. I'll give you a hand. It's all right. No, I'll just take the leg. I have it by myself. Watch your flower. You're pushing the flower in my eye. Watch it. Watch it. What happened? No, no, it's, it's all right. We've, we've got it now. I can manage it by myself. Are you all right? I'm fine. Just fine. Sit. Is your eye all right, Papa? Yes, yes. Do go on with your conversation. <coughs> Excuse me. Would you like to take a turn around the garden, Mrs. Ajogan? Lisa? Uh, but perhaps after a, a bit, thank you. <coughs> Allow me to get you some water. No need, no, just I'll be back a in a moment. <coughs> you were saying, my dear Captain, Captain Narinsky was telling us about the cruel conditions under which soldiers must live, Papa. So he talked, and so she listened. And so you see, you see what it is to exist as an interruption, a break in everybody's conversation. Nobody is just a break in the conversation. We all have our place. From the peasant to the czar, we have our place. 
This is God's universe. This is not a madhouse of useless places. Rats! How well the conversation proceeds now that I have left. Bismiyakov no longer coughs. He no longer even finds it necessary to clear his throat. Mama Ajogan does not have to refuse a walk in the garden. Papa Ajogan is no longer set to the task of moving chairs. Everybody is dug in. Conversation, now that I am gone, becomes pure song. For you, Lisa. Did you not know that the rose was for you? Do young men carry roses for nothing? Go on, you Othello of the steps, with your big wars, your killings, your medals. Go on, Lisa, fall in love with his black boots, his mustache, his eyes, and gallantries. What could I bring to you to match those gifts? And you, stand in the arches of the doorway with your water glass and your rose. Stand there until the sky falls down for all the difference it makes. It should have been enough for you to sleep your way through life dreaming of happiness. Oh, time, that was, and time that never more shall be, I give you back your woods, your pathways, your shadowed glades. I give you back her whose dear sweet lips once brushed my heart. I give you back the earth I knelt upon to take a crown. I give you back the happiness of days now fled from me. I give back... No. No. Nothing. I give back nothing. Nothing was definite until the night of the dance. Listen, I am not the type that deludes himself. She was no more his than mine the night of the dance. No more mine than his. I think it's mighty strange, Mr. Tolkaturin, that you could be in our little town for so many months and we never meeting. I'll bet you came in for the dance. What? I said it's strange we haven't met previously. I'll just bet you came in for the dance. Everybody does. Came in where? Why in town? No, I've been here for months. Oh, strange we never met before. Yes, yes, very strange. Everybody seems to be having such a gay time, don't you think? I just love dances. I can't seem to remember who I am when I'm dancing. Isn't that funny? I start out by saying, Tanya, you must remember your own name. You silly girl, you mustn't forget your own name. But then I feel myself saying, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And the room begins to swirl around and around, and the music seems to slide right down into my shoes. Many of the gentlemen I know seem to be absent tonight. <laughs> Did he say something to me? Did you hear him say something as he danced by? The captain? Yes, him. I'm sure I don't know. I don't think so. No, he made a noise. Is anything wrong, Mr. Chilkaturin? No, why should something be wrong? I don't know. Then what are you talking about? Come, let's dance. Provincials, you eaters of onions, you sleepers of sheep. Who 
invited you to the dance? Who told you to come? Wasn't it enough you had your fat-legged wives? Your pimple-nosed children? And you, captain of killing, weren't there enough women in Petersburg to satisfy you? Let me tell you, my friend, go polish your boots in another neighborhood. Did I come around bothering your women? Did I ever come to Petersburg and bother your women? Did I ever take the pursuit? Ah, Mr. Chokachurin, where have you been keeping yourself? Are you enjoying yourself? Do not mock me. What? It is you who deserves to be mocked, you hollow-brained imitation of a peacock. In a moment. I'll kick your head in if you laugh at me. Not here. In a moment, I understand you. Call up. Uh, take us to Lisa. Go back to Petersburg. Now then, I believe we have some uh, business to discuss. Take your hands off me. Take I am not one of your down. serfs. There's no need not to handle this as gentlemen. I assume I am speaking with a gentleman. Assume what you like. I believe you have intentionally insulted me. Believe what you like. Perhaps you would prefer to settle this in a duel? As you wish. If you do not withdraw your remarks, it shall be my wish to challenge you. It shall also be my unfortunate choice to have to kill you. Let me assure you, I am an excellent shot. Therefore, consider what you're forcing me into. I have no desire to kill a man. That means absolutely nothing to me, one way or the other. Nothing, is it? I withdraw nothing, you fop, you strutting suit of peacock feathers. You think because I am not a soldier, I do not know the meaning of courage. You think because I do not have brass bands and, and medals, I do not know how to behave when I am mocked. You mock yourself, sir. But as you wish, I shall have the honor of sending my seconds to you in the morning. Mr. Stukaturin. Stukaturin! My name is Stukaturin! Listen, Tulka Turban, or whatever the hell your name is, can you handle a military pistol? Yes. You'd better watch out, Ivan Petrovich. He says he's fired a pistol before. Oh, yeah? Mm. All right, Tulka Turban, I'm going to give you some advice. Now, now, the captain does not want to blow your head off. Until you insulted him, he didn't even know you existed. So take my advice, apologize, and the affair is ended. Then we can all go back to the inn and go to sleep. Look, it's too early in the day for you to die. You're a bright fellow. What, what lies between the hammer and the anvil soon gets knocked flat, huh? Do you understand me? Why get your nose knocked out of joint over a love affair? Go down to the stage line. Every coach brings in a new woman. Lieutenant Zimmern, are you ready? My friend, it is imbeciles such as yourself that ruin the summer. We are ready. Now, there is one round in the pistol. So you will only have one opportunity to fire. You understand? When it tells you cock your weapons, you pull this back with your thumb. Do you see? Yes. Now, don't be in too much of a rush to fire. There are no prizes for firing first. All right, let's go. Take off your coat and give it to me. I take your positions. <laughs> oh, here, turn around. Are you both ready? Yes. Yes. You will each take five paces. At the command turn, you will turn and fire. Has anybody found out where we're supposed to ship the poor fellow's body? Be still. Cock your pistols. Oh. Take your paces. Turn. Stand your place, sir. Shoot me! Shoot me! No, no, let go of me. Where is it? 
he going? Come back! Shoot me! Shoot me! Shoot me! Shoot me! Shoot me! There's nobody. Nobody wants to shoot you. Listen. Listen, you don't know what that little scar across his temple did to me. Nobody in the town spoke to me again. They didn't let me come to their doors because I, who wasn't worth the killing, had tried to kill the captain. She wouldn't see me. What right did he have to fire into the air? What right to scorn me from? What right to injure me? Help me get him to lie back, Mrs. Terrington. No, no, I did not deserve that treatment. What right did he have to shoot into the air? What was I supposed to do? Take his insults lying down. Don't snakes bite the foot that crushes them? Even snakes, just because I'm superfluous, am I to be stacked? <laughs> Where was he going, Mrs. Terran Tevenier? Why was he dressed? I don't know, sir. He said he was going to a dance. <sighs> well, take his boots off. What nonsense. <sighs> <sighs> And who, who was right after all? <laughs> after they didn't speak to me. After all the doors shut. After I wandered the streets like a ghost for weeks. Who was right after all when, when they came to me? Churka Turin. And they knew my name. You were right. Listen, my friend. He has made her pregnant and deserted her. He has gone back to Petersburg. He has moved out with his recruits. What is to be done? Who will marry her now, eh? Who will marry? For now, you know how it is with those springtime fellows. One flower in April, one flower in May. His day, his hour, was my whole summer, my whole life. Get me the pan, quickly. We must remove the my excess soul. blood before it is too late. <laughs> be calm, my friend, be calm. What are you staring at? Listen, listen, listen. she's... She's taken my father's boots. No, never Find mind the boots. No, no, don't let her steal the boots. Can I rely on you? Don't, don't let her steal my property. See, see to it. See to it, please. I rely on you. I rely on you. Well, well, what was that all? Katharina Polonaya says, if you wish to come down, you're free to come down, Mr. Zodich. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and what else? Nothing else, sir. But she seemed anxious. I don't know, sir. She seemed excited, nervous. I couldn't say, sir. You're a stupid girl. <laughs> when I'm master of this house, I will not tolerate stupid servants. Go. Uh, tell your mistress I shall be down shortly. Wait. Uh, just say I shall be down. Do not say shortly. <laughs> Try to do something about that smiling. <laughs> Shortly implies haste. Here there is no haste. For me, apples not to be thrown out nor to be hasty to. All right. All right. Gray. Neither too gaudy nor funereal. Gray has a seagull. Will you have a piece of fudge, meet ya? Do you like the fudge, meet ya? It is only fudge, Katrina.
I do not uh, concern myself with fudge. Man concerns himself with taxes, estates, properties, and bank balances. I know. I know. <laughs> but surely there must be time for other things. Other things? I, <laughs> I, I do not understand what you mean by uh, other things. Uh, <clears throat> match, please. Yes, me dear. Mm. I enjoy a man smoking a cigar. <laughs> oh, your uh, late husband did not smoke. No. Mm. That is unfortunate. A house without tobacco smoke is a house not lived in. That's so true. Yeah. Mitya. Yeah. These last few months have been lonely ones for me, knowing that you were near and yet so distant. Yes, uh, you must uh, learn to keep your lusts under control, Katrina. A woman who cannot keep her lusts under control soon finds that her lusts keep her under control. <laughs> uh, lust is a devil's monastery on the road to hell. The seas have been rough for me, Media. Women by their nature are frail vessels. They have only their hearts to guide them. Yes, and so I have come to consider taking the helm. Ah, oh, Major! Uh, 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 to consider, Katrina, to consider. Now, to consider is not to undertake. It is merely to consider. Yes. <laughs> Yet many things are finally arrived at which at first were but considered. Yes, yes. Now, as you know, I am by nature an inclination of bachelor. However, since the death of my dear mother, who was constantly by my side these past 35 years, I have had the inclination to seek another who might be equally solicitous of my welfare. One who might be concerned to see, as it were, the uh, proper socks laid out in the morning, the stove lit 15 minutes before my awakening, mm -hmm. and uh, the wash basin filled with water, neither too hot nor too cold, and as it were, etc., etc., etc. In brief, one who might so conform her life to mine that we become a single entity of one mind, of one direction. I, on the other hand, would, as it were, seize the helm of our mutual fortunes and guide the ship all safely into harbor. See, a man can do no less than to captain his ship. A woman can do no more than obey. Nothing less is correct, nothing more is permissible. Is it then to be so nautical? What of love, Mitya? What of love? Yes. <laughs> On the sea of marriage, love is understood. Our love, Mitya? <laughs> Our love, any love. Well, I do not bring up superfluous topics now. We must proceed logically. Disorganized mind is the uh, handmaiden of cupidity. Now, my bill of assets, what you may expect of me in terms of physical property. <clears throat> Three pairs of shoes, two in excellent condition, one in used condition, those without holes. Uh, seven pairs of black socks. Now, the wash, therefore, Katrina, must be done the sixth day of every week. <coughs> two pillowcases, two sheets, and a one-inch, no, a six-inch thick Siberian goose down comforter. And your heart meet you? Oh, and uh, a bank statement listing monetary assets in excess of uh, 117 rubles. And your heart meet you? What about your heart? What are you talking about now, Katarina? We are itemizing now. I must have love, love, love. There's no place for love in the itemizing of particulars. <laughs> Katrina, where is your list of physical property? Here's my physical property. Feel it feeding? Yes, but where, where are your bank holdings, Katrina? Your, your movables, your immovables, your tangibles, and... My dogs, Mitya, what about my dogs? Superfluous to be gotten rid of. I'm not piloting a dog house. Be my pilot, mine. Oh, Katrina, where, where are your bank... <laughs> your bank holdings, Katrina. Your, your movables, your... How many horses are in your stable? I don't want any fudge. Hmm. What are you doing? Katrina, why are you talking? All right, that's fine. Ow, that hurt. <laughs> All right, let me up, Katrina. We will have a honeymoon in the house. No. We will never leave the bedroom. There'll be no need for you to right. work. No need to ever leave the house. Right, I'll raise the rent. Yeah. Mm. 
<laughs> oh, don't kiss me so hard. We did not yet. Oh, I want to make love to you. Love. Yes, make love to me always. <laughs> Never leave the house. Oh, patience, me. Dear. Wait until we are man and wife. Be kind. Be gentle. Uh, Never leave the house. Katrina, for the love of God, you're crushing me. Put your arms around me. Need to kiss me. Kiss me. Oh, get, get off. Get off. Get, get, get off. Get off. If you're coming down, Zodich, calm down. I haven't got all night to spend waiting for you. I'm coming down, Katrina. Coming down. Coming, Katarina! Goodbye, Miss Screwball. With a seal. It's official. Uh, come in, Katarina. In spite of everything you have come. Come in. Come in. L let me take your coat. Sit here. Sit here on the sofa. Soon winter will be down upon us. You're well? Yes. Good, good. And you and Madame Azjorgin? Well. And Lisa? Oh, my friend, how quickly the summer is over. How quickly youth vanishes. Smoke, that's all it is, my dear Nikolai Alexeyevich. Smoke and expectations. This is a different household you have come into. You must not blame yourself. <sighs> but they blame me. All of them. Anna, the servants. You see what ingratitude is? Could I tell what a snake he was when he came into this house? Is it every snake who walks around and says he's a snake? But he never fooled you, my dear friend. You knew him from the start. I saw no more than the show of things. You looked into the heart, you saw the snake in the man. Has he written to her? No. That is to be expected. It is just as well. Yes, that's just as well. Well, my friend, what can I say to you? You fought, you risked your life to save my daughter from him, and you only received contempt in return. What can be said to you? Your friendship now is all I desire. Oh, you have that, my friend from the bottom of my heart. And to bring Lisa happiness. If that were only possible. If I could only believe you could find forgiveness for her. It is possible. I do forgive. What irony. Bitter, bitter irony. The whole town condemns her. I do not you... care what fools condemn you, understand. She is not of less value to me because of fools. She's a young girl. She, she, she made a mistake. The judgment of the young is not foolproof. Yes, yes, as you say. If she will have me, even now, I will marry her. I will take her to Lambswater. She will be loved as no woman has ever been loved. She will be respected, I swear respect, that to you. Respect? Is that yet possible? Believe what I say, my friend. If you believe nothing else of me, believe that. Let the past be done. Oh, you have her. You have her. I, I don't know what to... You, you have her. Go, go to her. She, she's alone in the garden. Go, my son. Take her. Oh, your coat. D don't catch cold. Anna. Anna. Katrina Polomnaya, what is loneliness? Did not the Roman poets tell us lupus pilum mutat non mentum, meaning we are all thrust alone on a dark sea? A dark sea, a sea without light, a sea of gigantic waves. In life, Katrina Polomnaya, the wind blows. The wind blows. <laughs> 
And what is the effect of this wind? It pushes us along. We do not know where we have sailed from. We do not know where we sail to. We sail. Uh, no man can say, no, I will not sail. No, I will remain where I am safe. This he cannot say because the wind blows. That is the substance of it all, the wind. And what is the effect of this wind when we sail in the darkness, Katerina Polomaya? Who is to say how many of us are blown over the edges of the world? Which is to say, without metaphor, how many of us come to bad fortune because he or she sailed alone. To sail alone is to vanish alone. And uh, that is the answer to my question, uh, Katrina Polonaya. You have received the extra coal and oil I sent you. What? Uh, y yes, y yes. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we see that what is, uh, loneliness is to be alone and to vanish alone. To, uh, vanish alone. Uh, 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 loneliness must end. How is loneliness to end? Loneliness ends when a light is lit. Shut up! Hey, excuse me, Katerina Polonaya. <laughs> excuse me. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> and what power do we have to uh, strike such a light, uh, Katerina Polonaya? Mutual feeling, mutual regard, but even more than this, love. Love is a light. When two boats come together, they make a light. And this is what we call the holy light of marriage. <laughs> now we must ask, what is marriage, Katerina Polonaya? Marriage is a sacrament. And by a sacrament, the church means a sanctity and a union of spirits. Therefore, marriage is not based on material possession. Oh, no, Katerina Polonaya. It is not a contract of assets and liabilities. <laughs> the church does not intend us to inquire as to the number of houses owned or the number of, uh, of uh, horses in the stable. Oh, no. Love is above these things. It makes a harmony from separateness. It makes joy. It is above rings and rubles. It is the light that moves above the darkness of the sea. It is the, the, the star and, and moon. It is the refuge, the shelter, the roof against the wind. Katrina, know that it was not for nothing that to me your extra call was given. Know that such seeds of generosity, of love, did not fall on barren ground but that they found their way to this heart, which even now illuminates with respectful fondness. Ow. Now that you've been advanced in your position, you'll pay me two extra rubles a month for coal and oil. Okay. Katerina, to you, I offer this hand of marriage this hand of spiritual bondage, this hand of... I cannot marry you. You're too old, too short. <laughs> short. It is I who am laughing, Katerina Polomaya. <laughs> I uh, laugh to think that you can laugh at me. It is, uh, it is, uh, it is you, uh, it is you who is the uh, wrinkled fish here. 
Is that so? Is that so, madam? Well, it is I who stoop to consider marriage to you. I laugh in your face. I withdraw my offer. When I marry Miss Grubach, your tongue will hang out to come to the wedding. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Now keep your dogs away from me, Katrina Polomaya. Keep it all away. Your tongue will hang out to be invited. All right, get away from me, you filthy beasts. Come on, get away. Get away. A man of my position, your assets are nothing. I'm not interested in your rents. I'm not interested in your buildings. I happen to be a man of sensibilities. I happen to be a man interested in love, in feelings. Get away from my legs, you bitches. Get away, I'll kick your heads in. Get away. What did you expect for a husband? A giant? A ten-foot monster? Jack and the Beanstalk? There is no golden goose for you. You are no princess of the pea. Get away from my leg. Get away from my legs, you bitches. So help me, I'll kill you. Now leave me alone. Leave me alone. Gregory. 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 Madhouse, madhouse, madhouse. How brown the garden has become. How dry. Perhaps. Perhaps the captain will yet write. You think so? No. It is done. He will not write. Captain Ivan Petrovich Norinsky has gone to Petersburg, and he will not write. Shall I dig up these flowers, do you think, and take them inside? They will die in the first snow. Let them die, Lisa. Papa must have taken the spade inside. I cannot seem to find it. And what of Chokotorin? No, oh, that one. How hateful that name sounds to me. His petals are still soft. I can save these flowers. He has not left yet. No. Oh. Still he waits. For what does he wait? To forgive me? I do not need his forgiveness. Better that he had never known my brother. Better that the door to this house had remained forever shut against him. He is in love with you. Oh, his love means nothing to me now. I cannot forgive him. What did he want here? Did he come all this way? To stand alone at dances? To throw roses to no one? To shoot Ivan? For what did he come? I think... I think Nikolai Alexeyevich Chulkaturin came all this way to love you. <laughs> How good you are. You are an angel. What should I have ever done without you? there nothing then 
for Chokotorin. I have forgotten him. My friend, mm. if you love me, knowing all, I will do as you ask. I will become your wife. Miss Grubov, not Pandalevsky. <laughs> so, a story of lies. You're a liar. You distort. See what I'm doing? I reject your manuscript. I reject you. I stood in the garden, dumb and dark with hedges, stood as if the winds of a thousand centuries might wash upon me and find me standing yet. And for all of it, the roses pressed in books, the crowns of May, the duels, the summer dances. What for all of it, if at the last to say, Bismionko, is it you? the one that is loved. That is the ending. I am loved. I am loved. What do you want of me? I am the one that is loved. There's no other ending. And when I had passed through the antique marketplace of Samarkand, through the cries and fevers of the merchants, 
the monkey's hand fell within his cage, and there was nothing further to the matter. Thank you. 